Good morning. Uh, welcome, uh, welcome indeed. Uh, if you're joining us for the first time or the 101st, great to see you and great to see some old friends back as well uh, this morning. And it's good to have those tuning in uh, from home. I like the, teach, uh, the story about a teacher and she saw two little boys fighting in the playground and one of the boys hit the other boy and uh, the teacher brought him into the class and she made him sit down and he was to write a note of apology to the other boy and this is what he wrote. Dear Brad, Miss Smith made me write this to say sorry for hitting you. All I want to say sorry for is not being sorry because I tried to feel sorry, but I don't. <laughs> well, he was honest, and I think he probably was maybe destined to be a politician when he grew up because uh, they can get out of saying sorry quite well too. I guess none of us likes to actually have to make an apology or say sorry to somebody, but it can be even harder when we have to forgive somebody who has hurt us. And that's what we're going to be thinking about this morning. And hopefully we're going to discover at least one of the keys that enables us to do that. Our first hymn is a hymn, however, about God's amazing forgiveness for us. What love could remember, no wrongs we have done. We stand. Thank mm -hmm. you.
Lord, we thank you that although our sins are many, your mercy is even greater, and your forgiveness, Lord, amazes us. So may we be brought home to that place, Lord, with you, of uh, praising you, Lord, for your amazing mercy and forgiveness today. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. As we confess our sins now, so we come to him in faith. Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, open our lips. O God, make speed to save us. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. And we praise God as we read the words of today's psalm. It's 114, not 128, but the words are right. When Israel came out of Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people of a strange tongue, Judah became his sanctuary, Israel his dominion. The sea saw that and fled. Jordan was driven back. The mountains skipped like rams. What ailed you, O sea, that you fled? O Jordan, that you were driven back. You mountains, that you skipped like rams. You little hills, like young sheep. Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turns the hard rock into a pool of water, the flint stone into a springing well. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Please, seat, uh, please be seated for the first of our two readings. You can find the readings uh, on the notice sheet. The first reading is from Romans chapter 14, 1 to 12. Don't argue with other believers about what they think is right or wrong. For instance, one person believes it's all right to eat anything, but another believer with a sensitive conscience will eat only vegetables. Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't. Those who eat any kind of food do so to honour the Lord since they give thanks to God before eating. And those who refuse to eat certain foods also want to please the Lord and give thanks to God. For we don't live for ourselves or die for ourselves. If we live, it's to honour the Lord. And if we die, it's to honour the Lord. So why do you condemn another believer? Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. This is the word of the Lord. We remain seated as we read the first part of the Canticle Te Deum. Uh, these words celebrate that we're part of a great worldwide family. Uh, of all kinds of believers. We praise you, O God. We acclaim you as the Lord. All creation worships you, the Father everlasting. To you, all angels, all the powers of heaven, the cherubim and seraphim, sing in endless praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. 
the glorious company of apostles praise you, the noble fellowship of prophets praise you, the white-robed army of martyrs praise you. Throughout the world, the Holy Church acclaims you, Father of majesty unbounded, your true and only Son, worthy of all praise, the Holy Spirit, advocate and guide. And now we have our second reading. The second reading is taken from Matthew 18, 15 to 21 and 35. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times. Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him, and forgive him the debt. But the same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii. And seasoning him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison, until he should pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgive you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave, as I had mercy on you? And in anger his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he should pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do every one, do to every one of you, if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everybody. If you had a cold this week, I've had a cold. My, I'm very hoarse today. Do you notice that? I'm going for the sympathy vote already. But anyway, I, I brought something to show you. Let me see. Oh. <laughs> Who are you? Hey, I asked first. Right. Oh, a letter. Yeah, well, I don't know. They don't know you either, I don't think. <laughs> right. Okay, that's what letters say. My name is Parker. I'm an Amazonian bird of paradise. No, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought Amazonian birds of paradise were multicolored. They're pink and yellow and stuff in them. You're blue. <laughs> right. Let me translate for you. <laughs> the male Amazonian bird of paradise is blue and not multicolored. Okay. Now let's see. I have traveled to your country to seek out my family as we were separated at egg. What? Oh, I get it. Yeah, sorry. We would say separated at birth, but you were separated at egg from your family. So you were, you've been separated from your family and you've come here 
Do you know anything about them? Your mother name begins with P. Oh boy. Tell me, what's your favorite food? Nuts. Small. With chocolate. And without the nuts. Who else do we know likes nuts small with chocolate and without the nuts? Yeah, Lady Penelope. Hold on. Let's put two together. Who do we think Parker's mother is? We're not going to tell him yet, okay? Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> hey, it says here that you are a stuntman? <laughs> Now, that's impressive. So you're a stand-in for all the big stars. Who have you been a a stand-in for? (laughs) You've been a stand-in for Tom Cruise? Wow. I thought, well, two things I thought. One, I know Tom Cruise isn't that big. (laughs) I didn't think he was quite that small. Right. And I thought he did most of his own stunts. So you do his stunts. Hold on, have you got an example? Oh. It's amazing what makeup and, uh, and the wardrobe department can do. And a bit of trick photography. Okay, right. Well, Parker, since you're here, We've been here in church, and there's boys and girls here. There's a few of them anyway. And then there's the big boys and girls. And we are here to learn about God and Jesus. And when I think about it, Jesus was a bit of a stand-in, when you think about it. No, no, he didn't. He, no, he did not do that. <laughs> yeah, I know that's very dangerous. He definitely did not do that. Okay. But Jesus is a bit of a stand-in because he took our place on the cross at Easter. He died on the cross. He rose again on the third day so that all the bad things we have done, things we call sins, will be forgiven by God. We might use the four fours. Yeah, I know that's clever, isn't it? Yeah. (laughs) Jesus was a stand-in for us so our sins would be forgiven and forgotten forever. Can we all say that together? Jesus was a stand-in for us, so our sins would be forgiven and forgotten forever. Now, we always need a little link into the next song we're going to sing, but maybe that message is worth jumping up and down about. What do you say, Parker? Okay, come on, let's have a song. (laughs) Thank you, Alan. Nice to meet you, Parker, I must say. We, we have the greatest respect for your mother in, uh, in this church. Maybe we'll see the both of you some Sunday. So we're going to jump up and down <laughs> and spin around. Feel free to do whatever you want. Ruth, you don't want to come down and lead the actions or anything like that? No, that's all right. <laughs> okay, make it up as you go along.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And the collect for today on the sheet, collect for Trinity 15. O oh God, you call your church to witness that in Christ we are reconciled to you. Help us to proclaim the good news of your love, that all who hear it may turn to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. And now Ruth will lead us in our prayers and intercessions today. Show us your mercy, O Lord. O Lord, save the King. Let your ministers be clothed with righteousness. O Lord, save your people. Give peace in our time, O Lord. O God, may clean our hearts within us and renew us by your Holy Spirit. Our response to Gracious Lord is open our hearts to your love. Gracious Lord, open our hearts to your love. Almighty God, we thank you that we can come now before you, that you are here waiting to meet with us and speak to us. We thank, thank you that though we have no claim on your love and no right to expect any mercy, you are always reaching out to us, eager to forgive and to forget. Gracious Lord, open our hearts to your love. We thank you that though we repeatedly fail you, and though we resist your will, you go on wiping the slate clean, offering us a new beginning, a fresh start. Gracious Lord, open our hearts to your love. We thank you that you love and care about each one of us, that for all our faults and weaknesses, you accept us just as we are. Poor though our faith may be, you're always ready to guide, to help, and to bless. Gracious Lord, open our hearts to your love. Almighty God, help us to open our lives to you, to be honest with you, ourselves and others. Help us to see ourselves as we really are, the good and the bad, the strengths and the weaknesses, the lovely and the unlovely. Help us to recognize our sins and to confess them, throwing ourselves upon your mercy. Gracious Lord, open our hearts to your love, and so may we receive the cleansing, the renewal and the forgiveness you long to show us. Gracious Lord, open our hearts to your love. We ask that you also help us to learn to forgive those who have hurt us and sinned against us. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can choose to live free of bitterness and anger over what others have done to us. Gracious Lord, open our hearts to your love. Please help us to release them into your hands and heal the wounds of our hearts. 
Because you have forgiven us, we can make the choice to forgive others and live in peace, joy and freedom. Father, we place our worries in your hands. We place those we know who are ill under your care and humbly ask that you restore them to health again. Thinking especially of Robert, Eileen, Jim, George, Gary, Brian, Joe, May, Bobby, and Bryn. Above all, grant us the grace to acknowledge your will and know that whatever you do, you do for the love of us. Amen. We gather up all our prayers in the words of the Collect Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, in whom we live and move and have our being, we humbly pray that your Holy Spirit may so guide and govern us that in all the cares and occupations of our daily life, we may never forget your presence, but may remember that we are always walking in your sight through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. I saw a very interesting book in a shop the other day. It was called A Hundred Ways to Get Revenge. So I've got my copy. You better watch out. But whenever I took it up to the cashier, she said, you'd pay for that. Oh, there you are, a bit slow this morning. But you know, if we're really honest, part of us actually likes to make people pay for the things that they do that hurt us. Isn't that right? That was certainly true in the case of Kevin Tunnell. You've never heard of him, but he knows all about being made to pay for something that he did. Every single week for 18 years, he took a $1 note, he put it in an envelope, and he posted it to a family that he had barely met and certainly would rather forget. This family had sued Kevin for $936 so that he would never forget the day that their daughter was killed in a car driven by him. So that $936 was $1 for every single week of her 18 years of life. He was 17 at the time. She was a year older and he had been drinking when he drove that car. So every time that he put that $1 in the envelope to post it, he had to remember what happened that night. And the thing was, was this, he was, he was desperately devastated, genuinely devastated, desperately sorry for what had happened. In fact, he offered to pay the family far more than that $936 that they asked for, but they didn't want it. It wasn't the money that they were interested in. What they wanted was for him to suffer. And of course, in a way, none of us can blame him, blame that family. But you also have to wonder, was that $936 enough? They've now received their final payment after all those years. Did it bring them peace? Was 18 years of revenge or restitution actually enough? I think the same kind of question was going through Jesus' friend Peter's mind in our gospel today, because he's wondering kind of how many checks we should ask for. Master, he says, how many times should I forgive my brother when he hurts me? Seven times? Now, Peter, being a good Jew, knew that under the Jewish law, you were supposed to give, forgive somebody three times, but no more. Peter wants to impress Jesus, so he doubles up and he throws in one for good measure. But Jesus isn't impressed. Seven times, he says. Peter, try 70 times seven. And this was his way of saying, actually, that there's no limit to the number of times that we should be willing to forgive people who hurt us. Even if they keep doing it over and over again, we should be willing to forgive them over and over and over again. 
Well, how could that be right? You say to me this morning, I can maybe forgive somebody, you know, if they turn up half an hour late for a meeting or something like that. I, I might even be able to give, forgive you, Paul, if you preach a sermon that's a bit too long. But the Kevin tunnels of this life, the terrorists who committed those terrible atrocities in this part of the world over all those years, President Putin and what he's doing to the Ukrainian people, how could I forgive them, especially when there's no sign of sorrow on their part? You don't expect me to forgive them, Jesus, do you? And apparently he does. And that's why he tells this story about a servant who had somehow run up a ridiculously large debt. It's, in today's money, it's like hundreds of millions of pounds. Somebody has worked out that if this servant paid £25,000 every single day for 30 years, then he would be free of the debt. But of course, there's no chance of him doing that. And the point is this, that that servant is actually you and me. We owe a debt that's far greater than our power to repay, a debt to God. We've just said the Lord's Prayer a moment ago. And the word trespasses in that prayer is actually translated as debts in many, many versions of the Bible. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who forgive us our debts. And what that's getting at is, that, is, is this, that the, every sin that we commit kind of puts us more and more in debt to God. So think, for example, of all the promises you made to God in your lifetime. You know, Lord, if you just let me get out of this, if you do this for me, do that, I do this, that, and so on for you. Have you done it? Probably not. And over the years, that kind of debt then has accrued massively. It's a bit like, you know, a motorist who gets more and more parking tickets, but never actually does anything about them, never pays them off. And so the debt multiplies at quite an, a, a, an alarming rate until that motorist owes such an astronomical amount that they don't have any chance to pay it back. And this servant pleads with his master. He says, just be patient with me and I'll pay you back every single penny that I owe. But actually, he has no mission of doing that. And the point is that you and I don't either. We have no mission of paying our debt to God. I thank God most of us have never been in debt. I've, I've spoken to enough people who are in those kind of circumstances, many at the present time, with the, the challenges we're facing in our world. And I, I, I can kind of imagine and understand the crushing effect that debt has on a person's life. They can't sleep for worrying about losing their car, maybe, losing their house. And the spin-off often was losing their family. It's devastating. And the weight of our debt to God is, in fact, even heavier because what we could lose is our eternity, according to Jesus. So what happens next is absolutely amazing. And that is the king writes off the servant's debt, just like that. It's free. No more debt, no more words, no more weighed down by the weight of it all. Now, I know that none of you do the lottery, but uh, if you did, and let's imagine you won the jackpot, a hundred million pounds, could you imagine what that would feel like? You know, never have to worry about paying any of those bills or you know, if you have to have an operation on your knee or whatever it is, you could even pay for that. You shouldn't have to, but that's the, the way it is. Could, could you just imagine the sense of freedom and the joy that would come with that? And even after you've given it half of it to the church, of course, you'd still be able to do all that. Well, in a sense, what God does for us is even more wonderful than that. As Alan was saying with the children, as Jesus went to the cross, so he bore the, the weight of our sin. 
taking it upon himself so that our debt is cancelled and we are free to go. I guess the thing is this, you know, most of us have heard this story so many times that it kind of loses its impact. The, the sense of shock, actually, at what happens. And the sense of amazement that God would actually do this for me when I don't really deserve it. I wonder if I could ask you, when, when actually was the last time that you got down on your knees and you just said thanks to the Lord for that wonderful, amazing gift of forgiveness that's at the very heart of our faith? I guess most of us don't do it enough if we've ever done it. And if you can't remember the last time that you did it, then I think there's a warning here. And the warning is that we don't make the same mistake that this servant made. Because do you remember what happens next? He goes out, having been forgiven this huge debt, filled with joy at being liberated, and he meets one of his fellow servants, somebody who happened to uh, owe him a few pounds, maybe a fiver. And of course, we, we, we expect that after all that he has received, that he will cancel this man's debt. That's what any of us would do. But he doesn't. Instead, we hear that he has this poor man thrown into prison with all his family. And we think, this is crazy. It doesn't make sense. For a start, he's actually harming himself. Now that, the, now that this servant is, is locked up in jail, how is he going to earn anything to repay that debt? It just doesn't make any sense for this man to act like this. But you know, vengeance never makes sense, ultimately. We might feel as if we're getting something back when we hurt the person who has hurt us. But actually, in the end, we hurt, end up hurting ourselves. So this is shocking behavior. It really is on the part of this forgiven servant that he does not forgive others. And yet if we stop for a minute, you know, it still happens. Somebody can come along to church and they can receive the absolution for their sins. And then they can go out and they can refuse to speak to a neighbor or even a family member against whom they've got some petty grudge that probably don't even remember what it was all about. And it's the same thing. It's the exact same thing. Often whenever I preach about forgiveness, and I always know it touches a raw nerve, and I, I, I kind of apologize, you know, for maybe opening up raw nerves for some of us. But often somebody will come up to me afterwards and they say, Paul, you know, you were really speaking to me this morning. I, I know I should forgive so-and-so and such-and-such. And I really want to, to be able to forgive them. But you see, what they did, what they did to me is just so hurtful, I can't do it. And listen, I get that. I've never been in your shoes. I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what your hurts are. Some of us have been deeply and very, very badly hurt by others, and we carry the scars of that. And yes, we feel that, that maybe they should pay for it. Maybe, maybe half of us wishes we could be like the, jil the jilted girlfriend who uh, had... 14 Chinese takeaways posted to her ex-boyfriend because she wanted him to suffer for, for breaking up with her. Of course, we'd never do that. But this story, I think, says something incredibly important to us, and it's this. If you quit focusing on what they did to you, and if you start realizing what God did for you, then actually forgiving might be that bit easier. So someone broke a promise to you and it really destroyed your trust between you and them. Okay, but what about the times when you broke your promises to God? How did he treat you? Someone lied to you, that can hurt, really can hurt. But before you double your fists to get back at them, think, 
How did God respond when you lied to him? When you made that promise to him and didn't keep it? The Apostle Paul once wrote in Ephesians 4, Forgive each other as Christ forgave you. That's the key. That's the key. But Paul, you say, it's not fair. You know, somebody has to pay for what they did to hurt me. Well, I agree. Somebody has to pay. And somebody has paid. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. But they don't deserve it, Paul. I'm not saying they do. But do we deserve it? Whenever we deliberately try to deceive God and do things that we know hurt him and turn our backs on him. It was while we were still sinners, Paul says, that Christ died for us. While we were still sinning, while we were still hurting him, he forgave us. We didn't deserve it. You know, we do pray in most of our services those words that we said earlier, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. We know those words so well that often we don't think about them. They come so easily off our lips. But do they come from our heart? Are we really ready to forgive those who hurt us? And if we need another motive, we should remember that at the end of that prayer that we call the Lord's Prayer, Jesus added these words, for if you do not forgive those who hurt you, then neither will I forgive you. Wow. Wow. A sobering thought, if ever there was one. I think what I want to say to you is, is this simply. At the end of the day, forgiveness is a choice. We can either choose to obey God and strive with his help to forgive or we can refuse and withhold forgiveness from those who have hurt us. That's what this servant did, isn't it? And look where he ended up. He ended up in prison. And I think if we are unforgiving servants that we risk ending up in prison too. Not a prison with bars in the windows, but a prison of our own making, a prison of anger, and a prison of depression, and a prison of all sorts of bad health. A report was re released recently showing conclusively that people who are unforgiving are more susceptible to heart attacks and strokes and other kinds of illness. I'll finish with this. Every time I preach on this subject of forgiveness, I always think of a man that I had the privilege to work alongside on a number of occasions. His name was Ben Ford and he was a detective in the RUC through the very worst years of the Troubles. He witnessed some terrible, terrible atrocities, and, and yet he brought a dignity and a strength that came from his faith at the heart of it. He wrote a number of books that I would thoroughly recommend about uh, his experiences, and in one of those books, he tells of a day when there was an attempt on his own life. And he talks about how that night, when he got home, his young son, he was only a, a young child at the time, said to him, Daddy, why did those men try to kill you? I'd seen it on the TV. It was headline news. And Ben says, honestly, in the book, that he really didn't know how to, what to say to his son. But what he did that night, I think, was so, so powerful. He knelt down, as he did every night, that he was at home to say his prayers with his, his son down beside the bed. And he prayed that night first that God would forgive him and his son for any sins that they had committed. And then he went on to pray that God were, would forgive those men who had tried to kill him. I think Ben Ford was, was teaching his son the greatest lesson any of us could teach anybody in our family, and that is the Christian's duty to forgive. But even more than that, he was actually showing his son 
the power of the love of God that enables us to forgive because we realize how much we have been forgiven. And simply, that's a lesson that we're all called to show. Lord, thank you so much for your amazing forgiveness of us. Thank you for the death of Christ that in some mysterious ways sets us free from the debt that we owe. And thank you for the freedom, Lord, that we enjoy because of your love for us. And help us, Lord, to know that as forgiven sinners, we can forgive those who have hurt us. And in the power of your Spirit, help us to show that forgiveness. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing our uh, next hymn on this theme. Uh, wonderful words, I think. Forgive our sins as we forgive you taught us, Lord, to pray. <clears throat> Please have a seat. There are lots of announcements on the notice sheet that uh, uh, I, I encourage you to read, things that, are, that are, are coming up that we should all know about. Uh, first of all, I want to say happy wedding anniversary to Jackie and Jean, who amazingly will be 63 years married uh, this coming Thursday. So congratulations. <laughs> And we uh, have two birthdays on the sheet, Betty, uh, Betty Moore, and Shirley here also has a birthday this week. So congratulations to you both uh, as well. Now, harvest is coming up, and uh, we're going to have a choir practice. So if you have any kind of a voice, if you just like singing, we'd love you to come along tomorrow night. We're going to sit, just sing a couple of very, very simple uh, songs. So we'd love to see you coming tomorrow night, 7 o'clock here in uh, the church and if you know anybody please encourage them to come along next Sunday after our morning service we're going to bury the time capsule that we had from last year gathering up all the kinds of things that would give people who live in the future a glimpse into what life was like in St Canis's in our 200th anniversary year so uh, it's going to be filled with all kinds of interesting uh, things and at, at the end of our service we're going to go out uh, to the old graveyard and, and bury that as a kind of a, an act of thanksgiving to God and also thinking of our, our um, ancestors in the, in the future. Uh, I mentioned harvest. We're going to have a, a bee theme on our harvest uh, Sunday. So if you have anything to do with bees at home, we want you to bring along on harvest Sunday. 
And if you want to dress up as a bee or anything like that, we'll not turn you away. Uh, also, if there's anything that would fit in with any of the displays, Olga would love to, to hear from you. So if you have a, uh, a hive or anything, I don't know what you could have, but any, whatever, anything to do with bees, you have a wee look at home. Now tonight, uh, we're starting our youth activities for the coming year. There's going to be a, a spark event in the Presbyterian Church Hall uh, from half six or so. And uh, uh, please please make that one among any young people you know who are, are interested. But also any, any of you who could give once a term even just to be there. You don't have to do anything except just to be there with our existing leaders, maybe help with the tea or something like that. Um, we really need to get our young people back and we'll only be able to do that if we um, get to know them uh, during these activities. So think about that, please. And I'd be glad to hear of any help. And the last thing I'll mention is the community choir starting up in the Fortinvale Community Project at the Vale Centre. It's for everybody in our community. I'm going to be taking it for my sins. And there's going to be all sorts. It's not about the singing. It's more about just the enjoyment and uh, 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 meeting up with people. So we'd love to see anybody who... Uh, would come along on Tuesday. Those are the highlights of the announcements that I want to give. Let's bow our heads for the blessing. Thank you, Lord, that we can come here and be together, that we can hear your living word to us, and then that we are challenged to go out and live it out in our daily lives. So give us your help, Lord, as we do that, and may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you, and with those whom you love, wherever they may be, and remain with you now and forevermore. Amen. Now, there is a cup of tea at the end of the service. Please do stay and have a, a wee chat for 10 minutes or so. Uh, thank you to those who provide the tea. But we're going to sing a very short song to finish with. God forgave my sin in Jesus' name. Spot the obvious spelling mistake there. <laughs> 